next speaker, our penultimate celebrity, is Keith Porteous Wood, who is the president of the National Secular Society. And he is here because he recognizes that all these changes are going to need a modernized Britain. Isn't that right, Keith? Before making proposals uh, about constitutional and legislative change, I want to share with you some anecdotes demonstrating the deference to religion by the government and both houses of parliament. In 2008, 140 years after the NSS started its campaign against blasphemy, I worked closely with Dr. Evan Harris MP to find an opportunity in parliament to abolish the common law offence of blasphemous libel, i.e. blasphemy. We identified a bill into which we could table an amendment. Sensing the potentially historic moment, I went to the chamber to watch Evan introduce it. Suddenly there was commotion. Evan was almost running round the chamber, consulting with the government front bench, opposition front bench, the clerks, and then even the speaker it transpired that the government had belatedly realized to its horror that there was a significant chance that the amendment would succeed. And if it did so, this would be an unacceptable humiliation of the established church. So, to our delight, because we were rather less optimistic about the amendment's success than they were, the government conceded that it would support it, but there was a sting. They would only support it on the condition that we withdrew it in the Commons and they undertook to table it later in the Lords and support it. The reason for this delay was to provide time for the church to be consulted. The consultation was a complete sham. The only acceptable answer was yes. <clears throat> I was much more skeptical than Evan that the government would keep to its bargain so I asked Lord Averbury to table the amendments in the laws just in case the government didn't. But I was wrong. Not only did the government table the amendment, the minister invited Lord Averbury and me to discuss its wording and how it would be presented. And it was very, uh, very key how it was. The government spokesman, Baroness Andrews, when introducing the amendment in the chamber, took great pains to reassure the bishops that this was not the first step on the road to disestablishment. Another anecdote concerns the Employment Equality Regulations 2005, a precursor of the Equality Act. After public consultation had closed, a late amendment appeared from just apparently nowhere, which permitted employment discrimination by religious bodies, and I quote, so as to avoid conflicting with the highly, strongly held religious convictions of a significant uh, number of the religion's followers, unquote. It's the sort of thing you want in equality legislation, isn't it? This had the effect, for example, of permitting discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. To the C of E's embarrassment, we traced the wording to a communication from them. It's almost like they had a teletype uh, machine in Lambeth Palace that went straight into legislation on the other side of the Thames. Um, a parliamentary committee objected to the late amendment on procedural grounds and probed in a, in a public meeting why there had been no consultation on this very sensitive matter. The civil servant told the committee chillingly and I quote, because the church considered the exemptions didn't go far enough, which prom prompted a collective gasp. And following our complaint, the EU asked for the amendment to be squashed, or quashed, needless to say, it never has been. My final anecdote relates to 2002 and concerns Barbara Roach MP, who was Minister for Women and Equalities and had splendid office and close to number 10 overlooking Horse Guards Parade. I was invited to discuss religious aspects of the education bill following a submission we'd made. One of our key points was to ask that discrimination on religious grounds in employment of teachers in faith schools be removed. 
a little to my surprise, uh, she entirely accepted that the discrimination was unfair and unnecessary and agreed with several of my other points. Her last words were, I'll go and see Tony, Tony Blair, of course. My optimism was punctured rather soon afterwards, however. Days after the meeting, she was fired as a minister. Seemingly, the chat with Tony had not gone well, and the discrimination remains. I later discovered that uh, Tony Blair micromanaged anything uh, to do with religion, generally wanting to maximize religious exemptions. That's the end of the anecdote. So we go into, in the 25 years that I've been campaigning with the NSS, Christian affiliation and observance has, has continued its seemingly unstoppable decline in the UK and much of the West. That decline has been caused by the near abandonment of Christianity by the young. Progressively over the decades, as they age, this minimal affiliation covers older and older cohorts of the population. Now less than 1% of the population that attends the established church on a normal Sunday. To me, this is much more of a telling figure than the more widely reported uh, census figure that those identifying as Christian are now in the minority. Many of this substantial minority would, I expect, struggle to describe any Christian doctrine and may not even believe in God. It would not surprise me if identifying as Christian will be for some code for being white and not being from a minority faith. I'm concentrating on Christianity and in particular the established church today because of the constitutional implications. But there are some issues relating to minority faiths which need monitoring, but that's not for today. The proportion of Muslims in the population is rising, but it seems younger Muslims are very much more socially conservative than their forebears who seem more inclined to assimilate into the general population. On a much smaller scale, extremely orthodox Jews have large families and they're growing uh, very exponentially. They are politically very active uh, and increasingly challenging the government, for example, over attempts to police unregulated, unlawful schools. Some lawful Jewish schools refuse to teach any sex education even when it's mandatory. This frequently results in an uh, uh, inadequate rating by Ofsted. I even wonder if that is regarded as a badge of honor. Our institutions have completely failed to respond to this massive change in the UK's religious composition. There are just as many bishops in the House of Lords now as in 1960 when CUV attendance was five times what it is now. Or put another way, it's now something like a 25th of the proportion of the population attending the church than did in 1847 when Parliament limited the spiralling number of bishops on the bishop's bench to 26. A baroness the NSS worked closely with for de decades and had served as deputy chair in the House of Lords, was convinced that religious influence in the House of Lords was much greater now than she had ever seen it. A tangible example of this is the current Archbishop of Canterbury, pre-COVID at least, annual call for a whole day debate on a subject of his choosing. It's involved in, evolved into an entitlement. No one else apart from the main political parties can do this. While two archbishops and 24 bishops have the right to sit in the Lords, there are normally just a few in the chamber at any one time. But don't be deceived by this. Their power is huge. Other peers have to wait their turn to speak, which rotates around the parties and the cross benches. But bishops can rise at any time. Bishop, bishop. And everybody sits down. It's astonishing to watch. They can write to ministers and are always replied to promptly. And while in most other forums, those having a vested interest in a matter under debate means they should not vote on it, bishops can and do table amendments and vote on them in their own interests. The biggest benefit of all is being able to hobnob with ministers. When we, uh, we got close to abolishing collective worship and confessional RE in, in the House of Lords, a flock of bishops ran to the then Education Secretary Michael Gove in high dudgeon, 
He was only too quick to reassure them. The government won't let this happen. And it's not just Parliament, but the government too. Over recent decades, Conservative and Labour governments alike have made concession after concession to the religious, um, especially on education. Here's a few examples. Ever more favourable funding. More schools being classified as religious than it ever realised they were, and then able to enforce church attendance as a, as, as a condition of admission. Objectly retaining daily Christian worship, even though commun uh, community schools, uh, even in community schools by law, the only country to do so. And following a complaint from us, it, that was condemned this week by the United Nations. Retaining admission description, uh, discrimination on religious grounds, similarly con condemned this week by the United Nations after a complaint by us. Confessional religious education, despite legitimate human rights objections. And finally, discriminatory employment, unfairly favouring the religious. It's beyond outrageous that teachers in some religious schools, however well qualified, can lawfully have others less able be prom to be promoted over their heads to become head teachers. This was clearly against an EU employment directive, but the EU didn't have the guts to force the government to rescind this, despite our complaints which lasted over more than a decade. Another religious privilege, perhaps. It is in education where this absence of secularism most impacts the person on the street, particularly if they're parents. So let's explore this a little further. The number of Christian schools is almost the same as it was when the last religious settlement on education was made in the Education Act 1944. Now the majority of parents are not religious or have uh, no particular wish for their child to be brought up in a religious ethos. So it's little wonder they're finding it increasingly difficult to have their child admitted to a community school. The 1944 Act was the first act to introduce compulsory religious education and daily religious worship in every school, not just religious ones. It may be that earlier it had been taken for granted that such relig religious activities would happen without any mandate. Uh, but it also may have been an attempt to, start, to stem the decline in religious practice that goes back to at least 1850. So, what should our objectives be now? You may be surprised that I'm not advocating that religious schools be entirely prescribed. That would be a breach of the European Convention on Human Rights, and the time has come, however, for a complete rethink of religion in publicly funded education nearly 80 years after the last one. I propose that a condition of schools continuing to receive state funding should be, one, no religiously privileged entry criteria. Two, no religiously privileged discrimination in favour of religious staff of any seniority in appointments, promotion or dismissal. Three, no religious worship uh, during school hours when it, where attendance is compulsory. Four, no confessional religious education. Five, for religious education to be renamed and completely redesigned, probably to include citizenship and philosophy. Six, for religious bodies to lose any control and management of those schools. Schools not wishing to follow this model would be entirely free to do so, but they would lose their funding. What I'm suggesting is not without precedent. Something similar is being attempted in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, to break the educational stranghold of the Catholic Church in a country that's abandoned it with extraordinary speed. I do, however, recognise that religious schools will have religious obligations and control written into their governing documents. The vast majority of these documents will pre predate publicly funded education. Parliament has the power, which I'm arguing it should exercise, to overwrite these outdated obligations and control where schools wish to do so, which would enable them to continue to receive funding. Currently, especially in rural areas, parents have little option but to send the, their children to religious schools even though they're not of the faith. Many such pupils must feel not quite full members of the school team. This is a further understa uh, uh, understandable 
consequence of publicly funded religious schools. Community schools, on the other hand, should treat everyone equally, regardless of religion or belief. Furthermore, pupils can receive substitute, uh, subsidized travel, sometimes for long distances, to religious schools, though local authority costing, uh, cost cutting has made this much less prevalent. I would want to cut this out altogether and replace it uh, with assistance with long distance travel to a community school where none is available locally. I would expect that were the proposals I set out to be implemented, that many schools that are currently religious ones would convert to become community schools. No relig new religious schools should be built with uh, public funds. Both would help to make it practical to introduce an entitlement of pupils to receive secular education and much less need for pupils to travel long distances to schools. None of the above is religion bashing, but simply the application of the secularist principle that publicly funded education should include neither religious control nor the inculcation of pupils with religion. Let us now turn our attention to Parliament. Religion is already represented well, if not overrepresented, in the Lords by peers who are not bishops, the so-called Lords Temporal with their varied religious and belief affiliation. A much higher proportion of them are religious than in the general population. And the bishops bench duplicate this religious interest. And it's beyond absurd that 26 bishops are nominated by this church that so few attend. And the bishops are increasingly out of touch with the attitude of the, pe of the people and even their own flock, for example, on same-sex marriage and assisted dying. The legislative programme to bring about full disestablishment would be very substantial. It would, for example, entail disentangling from English law, church canon law, church discipline measures, and the synod's power, which a lot of you didn't know it had, to introduce legislation. Few realise that these are just as much part of English law as the Sale of Goods Act, and changes to these church laws, even to the Book of Common Prayer, need parliamentary approval. What a waste of Parliament's time, and it's none of its business. Obviously, I want disestablishment and a complete separation of every aspect of the church and state, um, but uh, that will be more complicated and time-consuming than removing the bishop's bench. I want the bishop's bench removed earlier on as part of Lord's reform. In theory, achieving this should be low-hanging fruit, in an academic seminar about 10 years ago on Lord's Reform organised by University College London's prestigious uh, Constitution Unit, not one politician I spoke to supported the retention of the bishop's bench. Yes, I'm wary that the political parties will be keen to back this. They seem unaccountably terrified of upsetting the church, as I think I've already demonstrated. Maybe there is a ray of hope. In recent months, Parliament, even Anglican members, have started to express unprecedented impatience, bordering on anger, with the bishops for failing to agree to permit, not require, Anglican clerics to solemnise same-sex marriages, while secularist principles also dictate that the state should not interfere with religious doctrine, provided it's lawful. It does not seem unreasonable um, for Parliament to say to the church, you're free to refuse to allow same-sex marriages, but this is so discriminatory and so out of step with the country, we cannot be party to it. And you will have to choose between retraining that doctrine or establishment. And Parliament got close to that by almost forcing the introduction of women priests and later women bishops. The church succumbed. Parliament has sabre-rattled similarly on same-sex marriage, but I can't see the bishops, almost all appointed in recent decades, because they're evangelicals, changing tack, certainly while J Justin Welby remains in post, although the rumour mill suggests he will resign before the end of his term, largely because of child abuse, I believe, uh, being covered up. Uh, he said he would uh, accept disestablishment if it were necessary. My nightmare is Lord's reform resulting in the replacement of the bishop's bench with a multi-faith one. Uh, which I suspect most of the other face representatives will be even more at odds with the view of the country than even the bishops. 
Of course, we need to get rid of prayers in both chambers of Parliament. Curiously, they're the only activity in the chambers which is neither open to the public nor televised. I understand in the House of Lords, they pray with their knees on the benches because historically, that was more convenient for those bearing swords. <clears throat> A particularly objectionable aspect of prayers is that those attending them can secure the best seats, leaving those left outside during prayers sometimes unable to secure a seat from which to speak at the start of proceedings. The late Lord Averbury, formerly Eric Lubbock, was a great secularist and we worked together for decades. He thought the best solution was for prayers to be available, but for them to take place somewhere else nearby, then those who prayed could come in and join their colleagues in the, in the chamber. Uh, and to conclude, it hardly need be said, we don't want any more coronations. Succession passes automatically on death. The flummery was all about the power and aggrandisement of the Church of England. Uh, they even said, may the king live forever, please. This was just in Welby's day. The king was almost a, big, a bit part being anointed by Welby to transform him into an agent of God. It's widely thought that the people's homage, that, which went down like a lead balloon, was Welby's idea. Next time it should be a simple ceremony in Westminster Hall with the monarch taking an oath to serve all the people equally. And it's only a matter of time before one of Charles's successes is not an Anglican. Will they become supreme governor of the C of E, if it still exists, swear to uphold its privileges and utter these anti-Catholic notes? Who knows? Well, um, thank you for being such a good audience. I hope you found that interesting. There's a lot of work that goes on, as you can see, that we're doing. Um, if that interests you, do look at our website, which is secularism.org.uk, and even consider joining. OK, thank you very much indeed. Beyond ridiculous, isn't it, that we keep company with countries that are, they have, you know, terrible records of having a, an, an established church. We don't want to be in that group. We are, to all intents and purposes, the population is a secular one. And we shouldn't be permitting religions to have privileges and to ha hamper progress in this day and age. So thank you very much, Keith. <laughs>